Friar Clement had no idea Camro was watching him in the store. Then he did something shocking. Friar Clement felt like his world had been turned upside down. He walked into the church and was met with a horrifying scene. The church looked like it had been hit by a tornado, with destruction everywhere. Graffiti covered the walls and shards of glass from shattered windows lay everywhere. Worse still, the gifts Clement had planned to give to the children that Sunday had been destroyed, some stolen. It seemed like a malicious person had gone on a rampage, destroying everything in sight. Amidst the destruction, Clement fell to his knees and wept bitterly. He wondered why he was facing such persecution when all he had done was serve the people as a good priest. After composing himself, Clement knew tears wouldn't solve anything. He needed to pull himself together and find a way to restore the church. As he navigated the debris, a sharp edge of a broken bottle pierced through his slipper and into his foot making him gasp. He felt a searing pain as the glass sliced deep into his skin, reaching the sole of his foot. He clenched his teeth trying to bear the agony, but it was no use. He cried out, stumbling backwards as the pain washed over him. But even as he grasped his injured foot, Clement knew the physical pain was nothing compared to the emotional agony he felt seeing his beloved church in ruins. For the first time since becoming a priest, Clement felt frustrated and unsure of his next step. He had always prided himself on having the answers, but this time he was at a loss. Clement wanted to express his emotions, but as a priest, he had to maintain control and discipline. He had always enjoyed the love and admiration of his congregation, and he couldn't let his personal feelings get the better of him. This was Clement's first encounter with opposition of this magnitude, and as a priest, he was determined to handle it with grace. Clement was an exemplary priest, striving to live a life worthy of emulation. He was an active priest, engaged not only in preaching, but also in the lives of his congregation. He organized activities like games, outreaches, and love feasts to foster community, and helped those who had become disengaged or strayed from the church to return. His good deeds extended beyond the church, as he worked to ensure his congregation had access to basic necessities. Clement leveraged his influence to secure support and donations, enabling him to renovate schools and hospitals. He had a profound impact wherever he went, touching lives in meaningful ways, and his departure was always met with sadness. Unfortunately, as a priest, he had no control over his assignments and had to go where he was posted. Whenever Clement was transferred to a new church, the parishioners he was leaving behind would cry profusely. They would throw a big party to celebrate him and bid him farewell with numerous gifts. It was always a bittersweet moment for him. He was happy to have made a lasting impact on the community and was confident that they would never forget him. This had been Clement's experience and he'd grown accustomed to it. However, things changed when he arrived at his new church. During his first Mass, he noticed that the majority of the congregation consisted of elderly individuals and children. The number of youths was surprisingly small, so few that he could count them on one hand. This was unusual, as young people were always a crucial part of his plans, as he knew they would be instrumental in helping him revitalize the church and community. Clement sensed that something was amiss. He'd always relied on the energy and enthusiasm of young people to help him build and grow a community. Without them, he wondered how he would be able to make a meaningful impact. He felt a sense of concern and uncertainty, knowing that he had to find a way to reach and engage the young people in this new church. After Mass, Clement convened a brief meeting with the available youths. He inquired about the youth president and was told it was a young man named Fred. However, Fred was absent from church that Sunday. In fact, he'd been absent for over six months. None of the youth executives had attended church in a long time. Clement asked if Fred was ill or indisposed, but they responded negatively. Fred had simply chosen not to attend. This was a dereliction of duty and Clement couldn't tolerate it. Although he was kind and loved being compassionate towards his congregation, he also knew when to be firm. Someone like Fred should have been a role model for the other youths and the children. It was disappointing that he wasn't taking his responsibilities seriously. Yearning for a change, Clement immediately dissolved the existing executive team and declared it defunct. He then appointed temporary leaders to oversee the youth until they could elect new, more effective leaders. This move was sure to boost youth participation in the church. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning of Clement's challenges. 
The next Sunday, as Clement was about to celebrate Mass, he was startled by protest chants coming from outside the church. Shocked, he froze and listened intently. The chants grew louder and more unmistakable by the second. He rushed outside and was taken aback by the crowd of protesters gathered outside the church. The crowd consisted of youths holding placards that read, Clement must go. At the forefront of the protest was Fred, the incumbent president, who looked furious. Fred told Clement he had no right to remove him as president, claiming he'd held the position since turning 18 and knew what leadership entailed. He demanded the immediate reinstatement of the executives, threatening to continue to protest otherwise. Clement attempted to reason with them, but they were unyielding. He asked Fred to return with delegates for a meeting in a more suitable setting, but Fred refused to back down. He demanded an immediate response from Clement. With no other option, Clement called the police and reported the protesters for trespassing and disorderly conduct. He threatened to have them arrested and vowed to press charges. This intimidated them, and they fled before the police arrived. Before fleeing, Fred glared at Clement and warned him to leave the community. He threatened to make his stay unbearable if he didn't comply. The threat had no effect on Clement. He continued his life's work, serving God with the small group of available youths. They worked tirelessly to revitalize the church, repainting it and making it visually appealing. They didn't stop there. They also started a farm and planted flowers around the church, further enhancing its beauty. Six months after Clement's arrival at the church, the Catholic Diocese soon announced a competition involving quizzes, singing, and dancing. This was a highly competitive event, and St. George had never participated due to a lack of representatives. However, Clement was determined to change this. He was confident that his group of youths could make it happen. He chose three youths for the quiz competition and began teaching them everything they needed to know to prepare for the quiz. It was hectic, but he was willing to make the necessary sacrifices. Fortunately, the youths were also putting in equal effort, sharing his desire to win. With their combined dedication, they were ready to face the competition. Clement also had a candidate in mind for the singing competition. Her name was Salome. Her name was synonymous with talent, and she had the voice of an angel. During rehearsals, Clement would sit beside Salome in an empty church. He would close his eyes as Salome's powerful vocals filled the pews as she sang Ave Maria. The priest would feel goosebumps rise on his skin as Salome poured her heart and soul into every note. Father Clement's heart would swell with pride and hope as he envisioned her on stage, her voice soaring, bringing joy and inspiration to all who listened. He prayed fervently for her success, knowing that this competition could be a turning point in her life. On the eve of the competition, Father Clement joined them for rehearsal as usual. When they were done, he prayed for them and even shared a cake with them all. He instructed the participants to arrive at the church by 7 a.m. the next day. Clement would drive them to the venue, which was an hour away. With the competition starting at noon, he was confident they would arrive with plenty of time to spare. Little did he know a major challenge was looming, threatening to disrupt their plans. The next morning, everyone arrived on time except Salome. Clement was worried and feared that she had gotten cold feet. As the minutes ticked by and turned into an hour, his worry grew. He tried calling her, but her phone was off, and he didn't know her address. Sadly, none of the other participants knew her address either. At that moment, Clement regretted not knowing her address, which would have been helpful. They waited until 9 a.m., and by then, they were certain she wouldn't show up. So, with a heavy heart, they departed without her. Although their plans had been disrupted, they were still determined to do their best no matter what. Throughout the singing competition, Clement couldn't help but glance at the door, hoping Salome would miraculously arrive and turn the tide in their favor. Sadly, that never happened. When it was time for the quiz competition, the selected youths participated brilliantly. Eventually, the competition came to an end and it was time to announce the results. Father Clement shut his eyes tight, bracing himself for disappointment. They called the winners for the singing category and the priest struggled to force back tears knowing Salome was a strong contender. He was about to lose hope when he heard, St. Gregory, first position. His parish was announced as the winner of the quiz category. Father Charles couldn't contain his emotions. He jumped for joy and hugged each of the participants. They'd done it. They'd won. Clement was overjoyed as his parish was awarded medals and gifts. He planned to present them to the winners that Sunday. 
Unfortunately, the celebration was short-lived. When eventually they returned to the church, they were shocked to find Salome sitting on the steps crying profusely. They gathered around and Clement helped her up, asking if she was okay. She nodded, then burst into fresh tears. She apologized for disappointing them. She explained that she left home early for church, but had been ambushed by a masked man who dragged her to an abandoned building and held her captive. He told her she wouldn't participate in the competition. Clement was devastated. He was accustomed to being targeted, but he wouldn't let anyone harm his parishioners. He suspected Fred's involvement, but he lacked proof. Besides, Salome mentioned that the attacker had a mask, making it impossible for her to identify him. Clement assured Salome that there was no need to be sad. She was safe and the team had won the quiz competition. He assured her that everything would be okay and he would handle it. He promised she would participate in the next competition and emerge victorious. Despite the challenges he faced, Clement remained determined to protect his members and uncover the truth behind Salome's abduction. Little did he know this was only the beginning of a greater threat to the church and its community. The next morning, Clement woke up to find the church vandalized. Everything in sight had been defaced and destroyed, and the competition gifts had been stolen. This was pure evil. Clement still suspected Fred, but this time he no longer cared about obtaining proof. He reported the vandalism and Salome's abduction to the police, informing them that Fred was the suspected culprit or mastermind. The police promised to investigate, and Clement continued with his life as usual. Saturday arrived, and he still needed to present the gifts to the winners the next day Sunday. But since they'd been stolen and destroyed, he decided to replace them with his own funds. That evening, Clement drove to the store to purchase books for the kids. A staff member offered to carry the books to his car, and Clement thanked him profusely, telling him where the car was parked. Clement had grown accustomed to this kind of gesture over time and found it was always better to accept their help rather than decline. The staff hurried ahead, while Clement followed at a more leisurely pace, twirling his car key around his finger as he made his way toward the exit. However, as he approached the door, he noticed a young lady standing suspiciously near the perfume shelf. Her posture suggested she was trying to hide something. Clement slowed his pace, keeping an eye on her while pretending not to notice her. The young lady glanced around, ensuring no one was watching. Quickly, she picked a perfume off the shelf and slipped it into her jacket pocket. Then, after another glance around, she walked towards the exit, trying to appear nonchalant. Clement shook his head sadly as he watched her. That was clearly theft. Clement's conscience wouldn't allow her to leave with the perfume. However, he also knew that involving store management could be embarrassing for her. So he opted to handle it himself. Clement decided to approach the young lady and address the situation discreetly, hoping to resolve the matter without causing her unnecessary embarrassment. As she walked away, Clement hastened his steps, catching up to her and gently tapping her on the shoulder. Her eyes widened in shock, but she relaxed when she realized he was just a priest. Clement asked for her name, and with wary eyes, she told him she was Shay. Clement confronted Shay about stealing the perfume. He asked her to immediately return it. He promised not to report it and suggested they leave the store as if nothing happened. Shay feigned ignorance, trying to leave, but Clement stopped her at the door. He warned her that if she remained stubborn and refused to return the perfume, he would alert security. Shay angrily pulled out the perfume bottle and dropped it on a nearby shelf. However, Clement wasn't satisfied with that. He instructed her to return the bottle to its original shelf, explaining that leaving it on a random shelf would cause more work for the staff. At that point, Shay became enraged, demanding to know why Clement was harassing her. Before Clement knew it, Shay suddenly screamed and loudly accused him of inappropriate touching. She continued screaming that Clement had been trying to flirt with her, but she had rejected him and he wouldn't take no for an answer. Clement was shocked by her outburst. He couldn't believe she would make such claims about him when all he tried to do was spare her embarrassment. He was so shocked that he stumbled backwards, his mouth agape, as Shay continued to hurl accusations at him. The other customers watched in shock. Some were disgusted and angry that a priest would do such a thing, while the rest struggled to believe the girl. Clement tried to deny her claims, but Shay drowned him out, raising her voice and calling him a liar. Things were looking increasingly dire for Clement with each word Shay spoke. 
If he couldn't convince the crowd he was being framed, it could ruin his reputation and further strain his already tenuous relationship with the church. For some reason, Clement couldn't shake the feeling that Shay's goal was precisely that. She seemed bent on punishing him for interfering with her theft. Shay continued to hurl accusations and insults at him. She claimed to be terrified of him and horrified by the thought of what he might do to others. Clement repeatedly insisted he'd done nothing. He revealed that Shay had stolen a perfume bottle, but she vehemently denied it. When he showed them where she had hidden it, she denied it again, claiming he must have planted it to frame her. The situation was spiraling out of control, with Shay's false accusations and Clement's denials fueling the chaos. Clement knew he had to find a way to convince the crowd of the truth before it was too late. His reputation, possibly his position, hung in the balance. Just then, the manager intervened, asking them to keep the noise down. He offered to resolve the situation once and for all. He took them to his office and showed them several screens displaying live footage. Clement didn't know that a camera had been watching him in the store. The manager sat down and started typing on the keyboard, rewinding the footage to where Clement first spotted Shay. They then saw that she'd indeed stolen the perfume and hidden it on a shelf near the door. However, Clement did something shocking. Instead of being satisfied with the footage, Clement asked the manager to rewind the tape again, despite his shock. He noticed something he wasn't sure about. The manager rewound the tape again, and Clement asked him to go back to the moment just before he saw Shay steal the perfume. As he watched, he was shocked to see that Shay had been watching him. Shay had been spying on him, following him into the store and monitoring his actions. She then positioned herself at the perfume shelf and stole the bottle when she was sure he was watching. She knew he wouldn't ignore the theft, and she'd done it to escalate the situation and frame him. Clement had fallen for her trap. He realized that Shea had deliberately staged the scene to manipulate him and tarnish his reputation. The situation was shocking, and Clement was stunned that someone would go to such great lengths for someone she didn't know. The manager had to involve the police because a product had been stolen, and Shea tried to flee, but she was detained and told to wait until the police arrived. The police arrived, and Clement reported everything including how Shea tried to frame him. Shea was taken to the police station, questioned and soon broke down and confessed. She claimed she had no grudge against Clement, but had tried to frame him as a favor to her boyfriend, who turned out to be Fred, the former president of the church youth group. The police searched her phone and found chats and evidence of how Fred had masterminded the church vandalism and Salome's kidnapping. He'd sent pictures and videos to Shea, outlining his plans. He even vowed to continue until Clement was broken and forced to leave the community permanently. The police now had evidence of Fred's sinister plans, and they could finally bring him to justice. They tracked Fred down and arrested him, bringing an end to his reign of terror. The charges against him were numerous, including vandalism, kidnapping, and conspiracy to commit multiple crimes. He received a lengthy prison sentence, ensuring that he would no longer be a threat to the community. With Fred out of the picture, Father Clement was able to work with the remaining youths. Those who had remained loyal to the incumbent president quickly turned over a new leaf and were eager to work with him. In the subsequent elections, most of the youths who had been active in church activities during Fred's rebellion were elected as new executives. Father Clement was pleased, knowing he could rely on them. This marked a new beginning for the church, as the youths who had once been swayed by Fred's influence were now working towards a common goal. With peace restored in the church, Father Clement focused on planning for growth and visiting parishioners. He was determined to build a strong, cohesive community where everyone felt welcome and valued. The church was finally able to move forward, free from the shadow of Fred's manipulation and deceit. Father Clement's leadership and the youth's newfound commitment paved the way for a brighter future. What would you have done in Father Clement's shoes? Let us know in the comments. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe button. See you in the next video.